Hello all, welcome back to the interview series. This is Dr. Arif Khan here, and I thank all of you subscribers for your kind support. Do continue watching. And uh, today uh, I am doing a request session. So this has been requested by a couple of my YouTube viewers, as you can see a few of the comments. So this is one of the basic MRIs which you may find it very easy to report, but uh, don't take it for granted because there are a lot of areas where you can give it a little bit wrong diagnosis. So the main thing to understand in uh, MRI spine reporting is which all pains to see it, which all uh, sequences to see it, and how to report it, the names, terminologies, etc. So we'll uh, just start with the sequences required. So basically the sequences which I used to report and generally most of the radiologists used to report this is we use a SAG and axial correlated image for in T2 as well as in T1 and sometimes if you are suspecting cord edema or something like that you can also use still images to confirm that or even if you want to see whether there is a marrow edema a kind of change you can use still to correlate that findings. So in this case this was actually a case referred to as for with a history of uh, persistent uh, unilateral back pain. So this is a case which I selected for you so that I can cover at least two important points in this particular case. So let's begin. So this is the SAG T2 weighted image. So we will put corresponding axial T2 weighted image. So you can see now you can see the sections being elicited very neatly and clearly. So you can see nicely so each section you have to be so step one first you have to rule out the presence of sacralization if it's present or not so generally in my center we ask the radiographer to make a stitched image which essentially looks like this this is like a pasted image so this using this image first you have to start counting from the top to bottom not from bottom to top i'll come to that part in, in, the, in a bit so you start counting from the cervical spine from top to bottom. So here it is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So there is no sacralization. So that's for sure now. So that part is now ruled out. So now comes the other part. So there is no sacralization. What about the lordotic curvature? It is almost normal. And there is no kyphotic deformity you know, anywhere in the dorsal spine as well. So generally in our center, we do a reporting on two sets. Like it is, a, we will do a main study of one particular part of interest and we'll do the screening of the rest of the part. So in this case, there was an interesting finding here because there was a slight uh, central canal narrowing here at the level of 2, 3, 4, 5, C5, C6 intervertebral disc space, there was a little bit spinal canal narrowing. So this was mentioned and given in the report and you can also see there is uh, some compression of the cord in this area and the signal is also a little bit altered. I mean, it might be clinically very relevant. So we had actually taken the privilege, uh, means uh, taken the directive to do an axial section imaging and you can see very clearly there is actually significant narrowing is there you can see it here you can see that that the posterior part of the disc is compressing over the uh, your uh, code so this is this so now coming to the discs so here as you can see the normal signal of the central portion of the disc will be bright on t2 weighted images i think unfortunately i don't have any t1 of that area and it will be of intermediate signal on t1 weighted images so like somewhat like this so you can see it very clearly here so this is like a, a, in the, a high signal area on t2 this is like like the intermediate signal area on t1 the reason is that the central portion of the uh, disc is corresponding to the nucleus pulposus it is actually a like a, a loose cartilage kind of material and it has fluid much fluid in it and surrounding it there will be an area of dark signal which will correspond to the nuclear annular fibrosis which is a, some like a filamentous fibrous surrounding the nucleus pulposus which prevents it from herniating or which gives the support to it so when a disc loses its water that means when the disc desiccates it becomes like this 
it loses its bright signal and becomes dark like this so this is so in my report i will be mentioning this as l5 s1 the intervertebral disc shows low signal suggesting of disc desiccation or you can write uh, dehydrated disc noted at l5 s1 level and whenever you mention about a disc do mention the height whether it is normal or not as you can see the anterior part is a little bit widened here and posterior part is a little bit narrowed here so there is an asymmetric you know, wedging of the disc here so don't use the term wedging because uh, when you mention the disc because it will confuse the doctors who are uh, report uh, reading your report so you just mentioned that is mild asymmetric narrowing of the disc space towards the posterior aspect of the disc here now coming to different types of disc herniations so rounding the nucleus pulposus which prevents it from herniating or which gives the support to it so when a disc loses its water that means when the disc desiccates it becomes like this it loses its bright signal and becomes dark like this so this is so in my report i will be mentioning this as l5 s1 the intervertebral disc shows low signal suggesting of disc desiccation or you can write uh, dehydrated disc noted at l5 s1 level and whenever you mention about a disc do mention the height whether it is normal or not as you can see the anterior part is a little bit widened here and posterior part is a little bit narrowed here so there is an asymmetric you know, wedging of the disc here so don't use the term wedging because uh, when you mention the disc because it will confuse the doctors who are uh, report, uh, reading your report so you just mentioned that is mild asymmetric narrowing of the disc space towards the posterior aspect of the disc here now coming to different types of disc herniations so uh, unfortunately I, I couldn't compile a set of uh, cases showing each and every type of disc bulge but i will make sure that i'll put a case review in, uh, in the next video so be sure to watch that also right now i will guide you through how to report on different disc bulges so we'll start from here so we'll go from down to up so this is l45 l34 l23 l1 l2 so coming to this so here in axial sections you it is much more evident you can see the peripheral annularis fibrosis and the central nucleus pulposus and this is the normal posterior concavity which should be maintained it should be present in all cases so uh, if you if uh, if it is not there that means something minimal disease this concavity should be there that is the thing this concavity should be there okay so when you come down you can see here there was a mild yeah, see in this level as you can see very clearly you see at this space level or oh, in the vertebral body level cut also you have to take in axial imaging and you can see what is happening here you can see the disc is actually much bigger than the vertebral body outline of the above vertebral body so what does it signifies it signifies that there is some amount of disc bulge is there so in this particular case there is not a focal bulge it is diffuse disc bulge so there is diffuse disc bulge but is it compressing anything that we have to see now so if you look at carefully here you can see there is diffuse disc bulge which is actually intending on the tecal sac this black line will correspond to the thecal sac which is the anterior line anterior margin of the theca but it is not compressing on the nerve roots here which is in the canal or or either the transverse transversing nerve roots on this aspect okay and what about the neural foramina how will you assess the neural foramina neural foramina is this area okay and this is the exiting nerve root of this neural foramina whether it is getting compressed or not we have to see it in coronal sagittal section so going to one side you see whether or not the keyhole morphology is maintained so here the keyhole morphology is somewhat maintained but there is some amount of narrowing in the inferior quadrant but you can see the cord is occupying in the superior quadrant so if i were to mention this as a narrowing and if it is significant i will be mentioning it as a grade one narrowing because the core the the nerve root is surrounded on all three sides by fluid okay so that is the simplest explanation of this so when you come on to the opposite side on the left side what you see here you see a much wider and normal looking uh, keyhole isn't it so this is how you report it so there is a diffuse disc bulge at this disc which is this this level 
this is roughly L23, L23 level. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is 3, 4, L34 level. Okay, hopefully, you, I, I hope you understood that. Now, coming to the next level. So here, similarly, you can see you compare one vertebral body level above and come down. You can see the disc is somewhat like oval shape now. It has lost its posterior concavity and it has become convex and it is almost touching the traversing nerve root on both sides but it is not compressing it what about the traversing nerve roots so for that you have to see the sagittal sections so in the sagittal sections you see carefully yeah there is uh, for any nerve, significant nerve for a neural foramen and narrowing there is no significant neural foramen narrowing on both sides because the both the exiting nerve roots look normal it is not being compressed much coming to the next level so this is important the reason why i selected this particular case is to teach you about two things how to write a focal bulge and how to report it so here what happened is that you can see this is the actual uh, bone margins and if you compare the disc margins it is almost corresponding except for the posterior part here so when you see a disc bulge like this this is a focal bulge and now in a, in, if it is a focal bulge how will you report it so it's a focal bulge arising from the posterior aspect of the disc so how will you mention it so you have three options i'll just draw and show you something else so you draw a line like this from center of the disc to a posterior like this so if the bulge is actually involving if the bulge is actually involving the central portion like this you may call it posterior central this is a posterior central disc bulge okay so what if the disc bulge is not like this sorry so here i will explain this it in this case so in this case it is not exactly in the center but it is more towards one side so I will discuss this as focal disc bulge. Okay, there is disc bulge left paracentral. See, this is center, and it is towards one side. Okay, so this is actually outside the center the center of the vertebral body. So it is on towards the side. Okay, so that is the thing. So this is a focal posterior disc bulge. So we have confirmed it is disc bulge is there. Now comes the interesting part. So all disc bulges will not have annular tears. Okay. And annular tear if present, you should always look for herniation of the disc. Herniation of the disc, we have two types. We have two types, namely disc protrusion and disc extrusion. So here in this particular case, if you see the SAG images here, you can see a T2 bright signal here somewhere. This actually corresponds to annular tear. So annular tear, if present, then you should see for whether the disc is actually having a protrusion or extrusion. How will you do that? So if it is having a tongue-like morphology, as of ours it in here, where the base of the uh, herniation, herniated disc, herniated disc is wider than the tongue tip of the disc. So this you should think of as what? you should think of as a, a disc protrusion okay so there is extruded disc here so once a disc is extruded then you have two things to look for whether it is migrating or it has gone sequestration so what is migration migration refers to whether it has migrated superiorly or inferiorly so here in this our particular case you can see in sag images very clearly the disc is migrating inferiorly so it is caudally migrating so i have to mention that also in my report so similarly when will you say the disc is extruded when so this is a protruded disc so when the base of the uh, herniating uh, disc is much smaller than the um, tip of the herniated disc like this so then in that scenario you have to consider, consider extruded disc Imagine this only this much is the uh, disc space which is torn here actually it is entire 
in this case and then you consider the entire disk as this big herniated disk okay then you should be very careful this might be an extruded disk which requires immediate surgery and you should mention it that way okay so coming to the back to the point so right now in this level it is in the alpha s1 level you can see a disk protrusion and which is also causing severe compression of the this is the traversing the root of this level on the right left side right side and here you can see faintly see the traversing the root on the uh, left side this is the actually traversing the root on the left side so the left traversing the root is compressed and posteriorly displaced by the uh, disc and what about the exiting nerve root that also we have to comment upon so to see the exiting nerve root always rely on the sag images which is much useful and uh, will give much info regarding the same so just see in the sag images what is happening to the traversing nerve root on the left exiting nerve root on the left side so as you can see here uh, the the exiting nerve root which is occupying the upper, upper portion of the left side is actually free it has not been compressed by the uh, your uh, is a protruded disc so this is how you report it now to the additional points what are the additional points you have to see first one facetal joint morphology this is very important when you see or any intervert any uh, disc pathology you always look for facetal joint morphology so generally you have an a superior facet and inferior facet like this and there will be a clear joint space represented like this and the, the margins will be smooth as like this so it is normal in this case at this level and any level above or below okay so this is there is no facial arthropathy the second thing is the thickening of ligament of flavor the reason why you have to look on to this is ligament of flavor thickening can also contribute to secondary compression to both traversing as well as exiting nerve root especially in the neural recess somewhere here okay so remember that so here there is no significant ligament of flavor thickening this all are normal uh, thick thickness it is not compressing anything and thirdly you have to see for any other secondary uh, causes of uh, uh, compression like a uh, foraminal cyst you can have a joint articular cyst somewhere here facetal articular cyst can be formed here the possibility of a perineural cyst in the terminal portion what you call as a tarlow kind cyst and uh, especially tarlow kind cyst when it is present in the anterior portion of an exiting nerve root it can cause itself it itself can cause compression of the nerve, exiting nerve okay so these are all the things uh, you should look in the basic mri of uh, lumbosacral spine hopefully i've covered enough uh, details of this if you need a further uh, discussion in the theory part i will uh, put a secondary video do put comments so this is just a, you should take it as a case discussion on mri and the spine for your reporting any any other queries you have you can ask me in the uh, comment section below thank you